Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Prends français, s'il te plaît. D'accord. Bienvenue à Historia Canadiana. Ouf, that came out weird in, in English and French. Our name doesn't sound good in French. Um, <laughs> Historia. Mon nom est Patrick et bienvenue à l'émission où on parle de la culture et de l'histoire du Canada à travers souvent la littérature. Avec moi, comme toujours, mon partenaire, Mackin. What's up? It's me, your boy. Oh, you're not continuing? You don't want to do the entire episode in French? No. <laughs> protest. That's good. Find me $4,000 if you want. I'm going to protest. <laughs> oh, God. I still hate that. Like, every single time you mention it, it's only been twice, but every t- single time I hear about that protest, like, fining, I hate it with more of a passion. It's it's like, you really have to wonder, like, do they fully understand what they're doing with that? Or are they just being, no. like, assholes? Like, do they fully understand that they're starting the death of democracy with that? Or, like... I think they don't care. And for people who think I'm speaking hyperbolically, as usual, I'm really not. Once you start taking away people's right to protest or mm. punishing them for speaking their opinion, protesting, like... Christ, imagine if this was in place when the trucker protest was happening. Yeah, absolutely. For people who don't know, by the way, we're ranting against the Ontario government's treatment of teachers, which is historically yeah. so great. <laughs> so... Everybody teaches, treats teachers so great, you know? They just have so much respect, especially in North America. So yeah. much respect for them and what they do. Mm-hmm. The, the, the value they bring to society and to they, children. They just let Absolutely. us teach, you know? They don't try and enforce what we teach. They don't try and tell us what we need to tell students. They're just like, do it, man. Absolutely. Anyway, what are we talking about today, Matt? We're talking about the government. Hell yeah. We're talking about... The Ontario about, government? No. We're ta- <laughs> Thankfully, no. We're talking about the federal government. And specifically that... I don't, I think, I don't know if you know about it, mm, but there was mm. this period between the death of MacDonald and the coming of our Lord and Savior, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, where, like, we just had, like, a crap ton... We had four, like... Well, it's still crap. Just four random prime ministers that just popped in, popped out, yeah died in office, all that fun stuff that didn't really Mm -hmm. do anything. They just existed. (laughs) I'm going to call this episode Four Grumpy Old Men Fight Against Manitoba and Lose. (laughs) In Australia, the people lost against Eve. Canada, the prime ministers lost against Manitoba. That's the thing. It's like our episode today. So uh, Mac pretty much summed it up. So after the death of McDonald. You know, the, the conservative government was still in power, but they had to replace their leader. They had but to because... replace the only thing that was, like, holding everything together. Like, the conservative exactly. party had to replace the party, essentially. That's the thing. And, like, because we, we talked about this briefly, but I think it's a, an important point to make when we did our Confederation episodes. It's like, we like to think that Confederation was, you know, a bunch of old white men. But at the time, a lot of them were actually, like, middle-aged. And relatively young, right, when Confederation happened. But because McDonald stayed in power for like 30 years almost, <laughs> with a brief interlude after a scandal, but it's like, but because he stayed in power so long, any replacement was inevitably going to be old as hell, right? <laughs> because by that point, everyone had lived a life. They had lived a full political life, and now they needed to replace their leader, and so it's like it's weird. It's one like, of those moments uh, where you respect a guy like George Washington more because he mm. he specifically stepped down to avoid a situation like this, right. creating a nation like a new nation that was so intrinsically tied to him mm. that he said, "I'm gonna step down. Like we're gonna bring in somebody else coming in, so that way, like we can we my nation can live on." You know, right? Wasn't it also Washington that? I mean, this might be anachronistic. I don't know. Because my American history is a bit fuzzy from that time, but it's like, wasn't it Washington who also advocated against the formation of parties also to avoid something similar like this, where you're just forced to fill in a gap while mm. a certain position is supposed to be in power? But yeah, and like, I'm sure all of these, like a lot of these people that we're going to be talking about today, where you were mentioning that they didn't do anything, I'm sure they could have done something, but they either didn't want to anymore. <laughs> they just they just got fed up with the position 
they either died in office, as we were going to talk about, or they were forced to leave. So, like, there was never that much time in order they never to actually really stuck put around. a lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank God. There's one. There's one that actually did some things outside of having to deal with Manitoba. And, yeah, we'll talk about him. Was that Tupper? No, not even. Tupper's our shortest rating prime minister. Spoiler alert. Well, he was the one who was... he did anything. Supposed to be, wasn't he? But he was, like, the choice that everyone thought would have been logical. Because Tupper was there from the start right he was a foundational he was considered a father of confederation Mm -hmm. right and we'll talk about him later but he was foundational to a lot of mcdonald's policies and so everyone was like yeah if anyone's going to replace him as far as like continuity goes it would be tupper but at this point and plus tupper was you know relatively young in 1891 he was 60 no Mm -hmm. 70 70 so re- relatively young comparatively guess, which is the same well, so we'll little. get to all of this we'll get to all of this is like god damn it i don't even know where to begin because it's just a chaotic period fucking canada and somehow we come out of this with, be, with somehow we come out of this being known to be a stable country mm-hmm. somehow it, it's still a it's still a mystery to this day how that actually happened but hey we'll we'll, we'll get to why that is maybe one day but why canada is stable yeah we covered it in pop canada the fuckery we covered it in pop canada folks so the other option that i want to talk about is like a bit of setup before we actually talk about uh each prime minister is mcdonald also liked uh, another candidate john thompson right didn't mcdonald but, also like his cousin i mean yeah <laughs> so who who even cares what mcdonald like he he oh he did like John Thompson as a politician, but he was not the party's general favorite because dun 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 he had recently deliberately converted to Catholicism like a madman. Ooh, that's big. yeah, that's a big no no. So um, the rest of the party didn't really fully agree with that, and plus at the time the governor general had more say in who would uh, who was going to be the head of government, mm-hmm. and so. You know, as the representative of Britain, mm. the ultimate Protestant country, not having a Catholic would have been like, mm, mm. how about no? Uh, and the last thing I want to mention, which we talked about on our episode uh, on education rights in Canada a few uh, episodes back, but just a quick reminder for people um, who might not have listened to that episode, but we talked about what was called the Manitoba schools question, which do you remember what that was? Oh, boy. Um Oh, it was about the teaching of religion in the school, wasn't it? Protestant versus Catholic school. Pretty, yeah, pretty close. So the the idea is that the the Manitoba schools question is important here because it pretty much co- uh, covers the period that we're talking about today. Um, and it's basically it was basically a series of laws that were put in by a, a reaction, I should say, by a series of laws put in by the Liberal government of Manitoba at the time that removed publicly funded. Uh, public funding from Catholic schools in uh, Manitoba. Yeah, right? fuck yeah, exactly. Um, and so that started a whole debate uh, as to whether or not this was constitutional or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so pretty much like that will be the major issue that will be covered by prime ministers throughout their brief brief tenures here so what do you mind. do with manitoba it's like mcdonald it, made this mess now you're gonna lie in it this is doubly true because as this is happening only six years ago we had like the red uh, the northwest resistance right which uh wasn't explicitly in manitoba but was started by a metis person right louis riel of course who was is very strongly associated with manitoba so the idea of like minority rights is very much at the forefront of a lot of these um, a lot of these prime ministers tend and because they fail so spectacularly to actually deal with them in many ways this is what will give rise to uh, spoiler alert our next prime minister <laughs> Woo! our next prime minister what's his name he I forget his name he's like he's on our one of our bills I think. He's the name of one of the, the colleges in Montreal. Exactly. And right. that's what he's most well known for. 
Oh yeah, I can absolutely. Guarantee, I can guarantee. Like I didn't know what that name actually meant. I just knew it was a name. So, the, I'm going to start with a quote here, which I think is very funny. So first John of all, Abbott, by the way. Yeah, well, I was just going to say we're we're going to talk about John Abbott, who was prime minister from 1891 at McDonald's death to 1892, and. John Abbott is so uneventful as a PM that he doesn't even get an entry in the Oxford Companion to Canadian History, which generally does put in prime minister. <laughs> but he's also famous, right? Or most famous, I should say, as a prime minister for this following quote. Um, That's never a good way to And this start. was written to a letter, in a letter to a friend while MacDonald was dying, where Abbott says, I hate politics. I hate notoriety, public meetings, public speeches caucuses, and everything that I know of what is apparently the necessary incident of politics. Um, and so obviously someone who would have such a despisal for politics and the pol political world is the logical choice for our next prime minister after McDonald. Yeah, it really makes the statement, because there's always that statement that people have is like, the person who wants to do it the least should be the one to do it. It really mm, makes that yeah. statement stupid. Like in actuality, you want somebody who wants to be there mm -hmm. in charge. Absolutely. Obviously, there's a balance between like they don't want to be power hungry, but they should still want prime minister. You know. Absolutely. Uh, but no, in this case, he just he was tired, and he didn't. Care. I'm looking up how old he was at the time. He was also 70, so it wasn't that bad. But he was just like, it's so funny if you look at a picture of him as prime minister. You see the just look of despair on his face. <laughs> if you look up John Abbott, 1892, he's just looking forlornly into the distance, just not smiling. He's just sad and tired. And I find it very funny because it perfectly encapsulates, I feel, his tenure. Woo. Um, so the, the one thing that he does have the advantage of in terms of claim to fame is that he does have the distinction of being the first prime minister to be born in what would become Canada when he was born in 1890, nice. 1821. He Canada wasn't a thing as we know it today, but he was born on the territory and mm -hmm. good for him, I guess. Right. Because the previous two had him. been Scottish and <laughs> yeah. Do you want to look at, do you see the caricature that's associated in the uh, in the notes on John Abbott? The one the with image, him being uh, his profile. Yeah. So the what's new the, what's Sir it John? Ah, I see. They're planning on the John A. McDonald, John Abbott. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Fine Absolutely. man, but hasn't so good a face as the old. Yeah, sounds about right. But it sounds about right. And also, I find it kind of interesting that, or at least the expectations that people had of the of this PM at the time. Of being like, okay, well, you know, he might do some good, right? He's someone who was close to McDonald. He, uh, he, he, he knew conservative politics in and out. He had been in them for a while, so you know, there was some level of expectations, right? And I feel like this image kind of encapsulates, like, yeah, it'll be a pretty smooth trend. Um, but as we as we will see, he was kind of a, just a caretaker. <laughs> right he was put in as a compromise because nobody wanted thompson even though he was more competent because he was catholic and charles tupper as we mentioned before was like the prime choice but he didn't want to leave his cushy job in london so they were like i guess abbott can do it <laughs> you're muted mac i guess we'll have to take this abbott guy you know Ugh. yep exactly um so a bit of background on abbott himself so he was trained as a commercial lawyer. He leaned towards conservatism early on, um, probably because of that. Generally, the conservative party at the time was, and still today, is like the party of business and of, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and logical. Um, yeah, exactly. So it makes sense for commercial uh, for a commercial lawyer to, to lean towards that, uh, that idea. And again, pointing to the fact that you know, he he was a kind of a good continuation of Macdonald. He firmly believed that the English were the quote unquote proper handlers of British North America or Canada in general, and that the French had really done their time, right? And that despite being an opponent of Confederation, he did eventually come to agree with the idea of Confederation, mostly because he recognized the use that the conservatives would have 
uh, in having on their side an Anglophone based in Montreal, which he was. Um, and actually, for a while, his house was not far from where you live, Mackenzie, uh, which is cool, on Sherbrooke Street, uh, close to where the Fine Arts Museum is. Oh, mm. very cool. Yeah, I don't think the, the house is still up today. Uh, I think it was... Uh, I don't think it, I think it was modified or, de or destroyed, but yeah, it's mm. not far from where he lived. And so for a time, he was mostly a senator right, within the Canadian government, and he mostly existed to clean up any scandals or errors in management that the conservatives like, <laughs> did. He was a good cleanup guy, apparently. Um, and one of the more um, high profile cases that he kind of had to deal with was in the aftermath of the Pacific scandal, right? Um, he was charged with kind of shuffling a certain Hector Louis Langevin away from the party. Langevin right. had been a prominent conservative in Quebec, and he had been uh, very much involved in the Pacific scandal. And he was like, okay, we'll just shuffle you away for a bit. And then... Langevin came back and still did some corruption <laughs> again because apparently he didn't learn the first time. And so this time when Langevin came back, Abbott was prime minister. And so uh, he had to deal with corruption again as mm -hmm. PM. But because Langevin was well regarded at the, in the party at the time, uh, still, despite the problems, um, he, they basically negotiated an arrangement wherein Langevin would resign from his prominent role in the party quietly and in exchange um basically they would downplay the importance of his role in any kind of corruption scandals right uh basically the corruption scandal that uh, at the time of abbott's administration was that he would he would claim that public works cost more than they actually did and he would pocket the rest basically like any excess money that he took from the government of like, oh, yeah, it's part of the budget. Uh, see, it costs, I don't know, 50 million to make this infrastructure. And but it actually cost 30 million and he would pocket the other 20 million, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I'm I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that's kind of what uh, he was doing. And, you know, Abbott negotiated or at least under Abbott's administration, they negotiated that like, OK, we'll just downplay that as long as you just basically become a backbencher for the government all right <laughs> everything cool everything's fine and yeah the second major issue that Abbott had to deal with is the return of an economic downturn uh, ah yeah. yeah it's like it happens every once in a while and in 1892 we you know it's part that. of the cycle of economics but let's blame the people when it does happen exactly you know classic it's it's obviously the fault of workers demanding higher rate wages and stuff like that. That's generally the, the good way to, to, to blame economic downturn. Yeah. And so it's hard enough to run things when there is no money, and, but when there's corruption popping up left and right, as with Langevin, but also within the liberal and conservative machine, it's, you know, Abbott was just really off to a strong start in 1891 of having to deal with basically putting out fires that uh, had popped up under uh, after mcdonald's death or that mcdonald had ignored we'll never know <laughs> because as we saw with mcdonald he had a tendency to sometimes do that where it's like if i ignore the problem it'll just go away or someone else will have to deal with it that'll be the next that'll be my opponent's problem and look he wasn't entirely wrong <laughs> like that's pretty much how it went because at the time people didn't pay an, uh, that much attention to such things. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, but obviously, uh, the big one is the Manitoba school question, which I brought up. And it really kicked off right around the time when Abbott started becoming prime minister. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, mostly the compilation of all these, uh, all these events, so hard economic times, corruption, rising constitutional conundrums, right? Um, Abbott basically felt that the job was much harder than he had expected it to be because oh, again shit. he was going <laughs> i didn't want to do this but i thought it'd be easy literally he was going at it from the perspective of like i'm just 
I'm just I'm carrying out until someone else takes the job. I'm just a poor okay. boy from a poor family. Spare me this life from this monstrosity. Do, 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 do. Easy come, easy go. Will you let me go? Yes. <laughs> yes, we Is will. Mila, let no. <laughs> Little known fact: that Queen song was actually written about John Abbott. There you go. So, yeah, and also, so he the the job was a lot harder than he expected it to be, or that he wanted it to be. Right? He really didn't want to take over that much responsibility. And also he'd started of suffering from ill health, right? And so all of that combined, he was just like- Seems like every Canadian prime minister was suffering from ill health at some- Oh my God, you have no idea. Like they're all just a bunch of unhealthy fuck. The only one who survived that long is Tupper. And probably because he only stayed prime minister for like 10 weeks. <laughs> like He didn't have time to- He was 1891 to 1892, to but oh, Tupper you mean, right, right, not Abbott. My yeah, bad. Tupper. No, 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 yeah. No, that's not true. Uh, I shouldn't say that. Mackenzie Bell lasted a while. Um, but yeah, the that's pretty much the um, the John Abbott administration. There's not that much to say about it, right? There's there's another caricature that I have here at the end of uh, the section of notes um, that mostly points to the way in which he much favored. Um, Is this a lopsided he, cat? Yeah. Yeah, that's what makes your head go lopsided. Exactly. But yeah, there's there's not that much to say. It's just mostly a way of critiquing the way in which um, he was very much in favor of uh, of Quebec, or, uh, or at least he was supporting Quebec and uh, the Maritime Provinces much more than he was Ontario in many ways. And, um, you know, by giving a hard, uh, an easy pass to people like Langevin, but yeah, it's that's pretty much like the peak of Tupper, uh, of Abbott's uh, time in office, right? Mm -hmm. And I tried to find some good caricatures because there were plenty for McDonald and plenty for Mackenzie. But because all of these people lasted like a year or two, it's very difficult to actually find some good caricatures about mm -hmm. any of them. Although there are some good ones with Bell. Yeah, I can only imagine why. Not for the reasons that you're thinking, unfortunately. <laughs> They were not so crude in the Victorian era. Oh, so this is that's the first one done. That's the first one done. I don't know if you have anything to add about him. He's just an again perfect grumpy old man. I think he's a very good. He's a good retort to say to people who say that people who go into politics shouldn't want to be in politics. I'm like fuck off with that line of thinking. Fuck off. That's not true. Yeah, Plato was wrong. No, but you want like not that Plato was wrong, but. You want people who have some kind of ambition to be there and do stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. all, I'm, I don't think people should want power, but if they genuinely want to leave because they think they can provide a better future, then that's why they should be there. I don't know. That's just my. No, absolutely. And forget if I mentioned this, but um, yeah, Abbott would die a year later after having leaving office. And he died in his home in Montreal in 1893. So, so even if he had the curse stayed, of the Canadian, I don't know how many actually died in office, but uh, they either yeah, die in office or they die right happened. after. Coming for you next, Justin Trudeau. Oh my God! Allegedly, <laughs> we are not planning an attack. We promise. In Minecraft, <laughs> isn't that the joke? Oh <laughs> it's yeah. It's like you could you could say anything you want as long as you say that it's in Minecraft. <laughs> And then you kind of cover your ass. <laughs> God, we're going to get a bunch of like questions. Uh, comedian. Obviously. Okay. So the next one that I want to talk about is John S.D. Thompson, which S.D., by the way, is very cool because it stands for Sparrow, which is Wait, so S awesome. Wait, S and D is together is Sparrow? Uh, no, 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 no. S is Sparrow and D, I think, is David. Uh, oh. David. Yeah. John, John Sparrow, Sparrow, David. John Sparrow, David. Thompson. Thompson. So it would be Jonathan, though, right? So it would be Jonathan Sparrow David Tom. I think he was baptized John. Yeah. Oh, what a loser. I hate yeah, him I now. It ruins the flow. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. But um, yeah, thus making it a trifecta of Johns that rule the <laughs> that rule over Canada now. So that's cool, I guess. Um, so Thompson would be prime minister from 1892 uh, when, uh, when Abbott resigns to 1894. Right? Hey. Uh, so Thompson had kind of been, he, he had, well, while Abbott was nominally prime minister, Thompson had also kind of been running the show a bit behind the scenes. He had been doing a lot of what Abbott didn't want to do or was, you know, too old to do. 
So this because is uh, this was, is different from the other John Thompson that we talked about at the start. Of no, this is the same John Thompson. So this okay. is the Catholic one, right? Oh, um, the devil. Uh huh. Exactly. The fucking heathen. God, they'll so, just let anybody run for office these days. What's um, next? They're gonna have a seek be ahead of the party. Oh my God! Wouldn't that be just the worst? Obviously. As, and then they're gonna. Oh they, he's probably gonna want to wear his religious headgear in parliament good lord ah! although funny enough you make you make jokes like that but hold on the oh no where is it okay i i have a poem later in the the notes that kind of points to what you're saying we'll look at it later but <laughs> it's not far off from uh from what you're saying it's the second link in uh the thompson section um oh. we'll, we'll talk about it uh later but um, oh, so Thompson yeah. himself um, would, yeah, like you were saying, um, be uh, be born from a modest Halifax family. I mean, he wasn't particularly rich. And, you know, that's kind of where he got some of his uh, major, you know, uh, how could I say this, his major uh, sentiments. Around, he was known for a passion for justice and he was known for his honesty and his particular hatred for cruelty, especially towards women and children. And I think part of that also comes from the fact that he was a little bit more down to earth in terms of the other prime ministers, which tended to come from more aristocratic or well-to-do families, right? Um, but Thompson was very much from a modest maritime family. Um, so I think that definitely informed uh, the way that he uh, that he thought and conducted himself in politics. And in terms of his career, he had served as an attorney general of Nova Scotia and briefly as its premier. And in 1882, so 10 years before he would be prime minister, he had been appointed to the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia. Oh. Yeah. So he would enter into the realm of federal politics during the end point of the Northwest Rebellion, right? Um, so right around the time when it was over and we were debating the fate of Louis Riel, and just as the C Canadian Pacific Railway was nearing its completion at huge cost, I would remind people, um, the government, hey. yeah, the government really needed some strengthening, as you were mentioning at the start of the episode, right? Already there were some cracks starting to show in the Conservative Party of being like, oh my God, we have so many blunders and things that we need to, and fires that we need to put out. And it's at that moment when Thompson entered into the Conservative Party as Minister of Justice, right, under MacDonald in, in the 1880s. Um, a role that he was initially reluctant to do, but actually ultimately proved quite indispensable in. He was good at uh, balancing all sides of the party, because we'll remind listeners that while McDonald's party is remembered as a like the Tory party, it was nominally the liberal conservative party, right? Mm -hmm. So he was, Thompson did show himself good at balancing those elements, right? The more progressive elements and the conservative elements in, uh, in his ideas of justice, right? Or as minister of justice. Um, and he also helped, you know, navigate what legal ramifications would happen considering certain uh, considering certain actions of the McDonald government, right? Um, and yeah, as you were saying, he would pretty much stay in a similar position um, until Abbott left office, right? When reluctantly, Thompson took over the prime ministership, right? It's more reluctant. So, yeah, not only, you know, himself, but the people around him. Um, and yeah, so I want to first look at the caricature. That's the first one under his name in the notes. Um, oh, the one where he's getting hoisted up. Yeah. So what does that say here? Our political so degenerate. Does... Well, the breed of politician, politician sure, surely runs party small these days when this is the biology I can, when this is the biggest I can get. Oh, this is Canada. Yes. So Miss Canada is holding up uh john thompson by a string right um saying that which uh you know not a great man no <laughs> or he's not as big as the previous one um and you know in in 
kind of reference to what you were saying about the uh, making a joke about Jagmeet Singh as head of a party. Notice what Thompson is wearing. Oh yeah, he's wearing a cross. He's wearing a nice oh, yeah. cross. His Catholicism is front and center here, <laughs> right? That's what matters. The, yeah, the caricaturist really wants you to keep in mind that this is this is really a, a major part of Thompson, right? This is his identity. Going forward, this will is all people know him as. Oh yeah, obviously. So Thompson actually wasn't that old when he ascended to the prime ministership because he was born in 1845. So he would have been, so he would have been 18. Uh, he would have been 40, 47, right at the time. Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't make sense. Regardless, he would have been in his mid 40s uh, at the time when he arrived as prime minister. So. He wouldn't have been that old. So at least this is a good sign. He seems like someone who's going to be around for a while. Although notice how the caricature is drawing him in this case. He is a very plump figure in this case. Uh, he's plump. And, hmm? he's, plump. he's plump indeed. And that's not entirely an accident in this case. It's not just a byproduct of the, um, of the caricature. I've read a few sources in which uh, that, that mentioned the way he, that he enjoyed eating very uh, greasy and dense foods. And I think we should keep that in mind as uh, we're going forward uh, as the stress of the job catches up to him, right? Like how he's going to die mm. in this case. Spoiler. Um, but yeah, and also on this caricature that we want to mention in this case is a bunch of papers that are kind of tumbling Falling out of. Out of yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, that allude to the Manitoba school questions, right? The opposing the constitutional rights of the people, discredi discreditable Toryism, uh, shielding boodlers, boodlers who were people who uh, uh, did corruption or did cor or, or corrupt uh, politicians. So at least this caricaturist doesn't necessarily have the greatest of views of Thompson. No, but I feel like most of that comes from his Catholicism than anything. Yeah. It certainly seems like it, right? And I feel like it also partially comes from the fact that he is younger, right? Um, because we've we mentioned him a few times, but that was part of the reason why the liberals also didn't want Laurier initially as the head of the party was because he was too young. So I think at the time there was very much this idea that if you were too young, you didn't necessarily have the experience or the know-how to be prime minister. Right. And I think that was also a slight against him. It's like, oh, well, you know, this short guy, right? He's not necessarily a full grown adult yet and doesn't necessarily know what he's doing. Right. Um, I think which, so he has nice hair, though. He's, he might be too young, but he's got, he's just not ready. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but this um, shit is on repeat. I hate it so much. It's a bad um, record on repeat. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the poem I wanted to mention before we actually talk about Thompson prime ministership, um, do you have it open? Did you find it here? It's the one, it's called Ottawa's, Ottawa Cabinet's Appeal, Appeal to Abbott. Abbott. Dear Sir Abbott, we implore you, do not leave us in the lurch. In the face of rising clamor over the influence of the church, mere suggestion of Sir Thompson for the premiership appears, sure to raise the very devil of a storm about our ears. You are sick, we know, and weary of the toil of party strife, and you well may seek retirement from the cares of public life. Gladly would we aid your purpose, but we dare not yet install Thompson as the actual premier that we fear would ruin all. We will give you leave of absence, and however long you're gone, we will do the business for you, and your stipend will run on. Let no public cares annoy you. Heed not shouts of praise or blame. We don't want your able counsel. All we ask for is your name. Understand the matter fully. We don't ask you to do more than if you replace Lord Stanley as the country's governor. Governor, do as little as it suits you, free as air to go or stay, but for any sake continue. We beseech to draw your pay. Sir John Thompson will relieve you when you go away from home. Leave him power of attorney to effect a deal with Rome. And to hoodwink orange bigots whose machinations dread, if you cannot be our captain, Please remain our figurehead. Be the kindly mask which veils the scheme by priestly zealots' plan. Be the velvet glove that hides the Jesuits' insidious hand. Be the puppet dancing ever to the tomb that Rome requires. 
focusing the public eye while subtle replays pull the wire. So shall Toryism flourish and our vessels true and tried to the honored name of Abbott, still our premier, point with pride. And the wicked grit disturbers would raise sec sectarian cries, find themselves repulsed and baffled, spite of their magnet lies. This is a terrible poem, but it is like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's real bad. But because you know at least it rhymed i mean the mark of a good poem is always when they rhyme strife with life <laughs> like <laughs> more governor but more the governor brought, the reason why i brought this up is that it kind of shows the sentiment that people or see some people were going for as thompson was uh getting getting ready to actually take up the prime uh, prime ministership or premiership as uh, this poet calls him Right. He's like, you know, Thompson's a swell guy, but he's a Catholic. Right. The, 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 mm -hmm. the references abound like, oh, the Jesuits are going to the, the Jesuits are going to, uh, you know, be more prominent than they should be. Jesuits are a very famous Catholic uh, uh, subgroup, um, you know, and, you know, Tor sh sh Toryism won't flourish as well under uh, under Thompson and so on. And they're a goddamn uh, so, you know, Catholic. Yeah, really. That that seems to be like the number one. Gonna bring the a number Catholic one whore into issue. our country. Yeah, Come on. absolutely. So that's the thing, right? With Thompson is as he's going into being prime minister, and I think he's one of the more interesting ones, despite not staying particularly long. Is that he was definitely a capable PM, and there are some accomplishments that were done under him, certainly more than under Abbott. Yeah. Right? But he, oh, 100%. He just got the flock for it because of like he, his religion. Religion, religion and, his and we'll see. He, his religion, his age, and as we'll see, he, he was also a bit reticent to actually make hard decisions. Like right. the accomplishments that he did were good. They're not bad, but they're not controversial in men, right? Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so Thompson himself would say, uh, uh, was known for saying that it would be a shame that Canadian politics be contested on racial and religious lines. But it's kind of ironic that it's under his prime ministership that that's exactly what would happen. Um, yeah. Let's yeah. see his accomplishments. He passed the new criminal code, code in 1892. Mostly saved mm -hmm. disdain, but obviously some things have been added because we got smart or smarter a little bit. So we added yep. things like sexual assault in there because that's a crime. He, he yep. set up Labor Day as a national holiday. So everybody who has those long Labor Day weekends, you gotta thank You him. can thank. Yep. Although it had been, it had been a thing in like certain municipalities and certain provinces, but this is the first one that it was actually done on. It was federalized. State. Yeah. Funny enough, do you know, I, uh, I've mentioned this before, I think, but like not necessarily on the recording. Do you know why in North America we celebrate Labor Day in September and not, for example, on May Day, which is where it's done in uh, where it was done no conventionally? Clue. Okay. So in there, there was a very farming, no, it has nothing to do with farming, actually. There was a famous May Day um, riot or uh, protest, I should say. It wasn't a riot. There was a famous May Day protest in. Uh, the 1890s or 1880s uh, that led to a massacre, right? The police were sent in and actually massacred the workers that were on strike and were protesting uh, better rights uh, at that moment. And so when it came time to actually put in a Labor Day, right, uh, the governments in the United States and in Canada, which was very close, were like, we don't want to necessarily bring attention to the fact that we massacred literally hundreds of people during that one May Day protest which was meant to like celebrate uh, May Day, which is celebrate to, uh, meant to celebrate workers' rights. So how about we do it in like September? <laughs> so a bit of fun history there for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the last accomplishment, or at least there are two last accomplishments here that we can mention. Do you want to read them off as well? You're still muted. Okay. So his other accomplishment, he made efforts to resolve problems with the U.S., but the aggressive American Secretary of State, James Blaine, was... Uh, a bit too aggressive for his tastes. And he supported the creation of the National Council of Women in 1893. Which Woo. the National Council of Women is one of them was one of the bigger um one of the bigger institutions in Canada and in North America to support for women's rights and uh, was a you know, one of the larger advocacy groups at the time. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. 
And that was in part because Lady Aberdeen, who was the wife of the governor general at the time, was very close to Thompson. Uh, and but then those goddamn Manitoban school boards reared their head. <laughs> and here's the real kicker. Here's the real mm-hmm. problem of why Thompson like was not the good right man because it was the problem was about taking money away from Catholic schools. Anything he did <laughs> would be seen badly. Yep. Like he would have to not touch the problem, you know? Yeah, that's kind of the thing. So right around the time that um, Thompson came into power, right? The Privy Council, which is kind of the higher authority in this case um, in Britain, that was based in Britain and could decide um, matters in Canada, right? Um, announced that Canada had the right as a federal institution to circumvent the new law in Manitoba. They could say, no, the the liberal government was wrong in doing this, right? And if, uh, if they remove um, if they remove public funds from Catholic schools, they would they would also have to do so for Protestant denominations, right? Just for the sake of fairness, you're secular or you're not, right? That's the type of thing. Mm-hmm. And Thompson pulled a McDonald in this case and just decided to just not do anything. <laughs> Pretty much exactly with what you're talking about. But he did like he it, that's there's nothing else he could do. It, it was the perfect damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right. Yeah. If he did something, he would put the liberals at um, at uh, at his back. And if he did do something, he would be accused of being like a Catholic stooge. Right. Uh, but yeah, he pulled a, a McDonald and hoped that something else would come up and distract everyone from the Manitoba schools question. But the the federal liberals under Laurier were like, mm, no, we're not going to let this one die down and they kept pestering it in in the house of commons which is very funny I mean, <laughs> so it dragged I get out why the, the opposition what would do it but like i could also get why he wouldn't respond to it yeah what was he supposed exactly. to do yeah. so not long after uh not long into his uh prime ministership so in december on december 12th 1894 only uh, very shortly after he was actually um, given a new role uh, within the London administration, uh, while he was prime minister, actually, he had a kind of dual role. Um, and I'm forgetting what the name of it is. Yes, he was sworn into being a member of the Imperial Privy Council by Queen Victoria at Windsor Castle. Fun. Um, like literally an hour after he was sworn in, they were having a banquet and he died of a heart attack. Like while eating, um, so literally he passed out. Uh, the The whole story is like he passed out. He was taken away and made better. He came back. He didn't even touch one more ounce of food and had a heart attack. And death, right, like it just immediately uh, collapsed. At the time, he was only forty nine, right? Um, and surprisingly, um, there were many, despite what we were talking about, there were many people who actually did mourn his loss, right? Um, he seemed to be a bit of a breath of fresh air um, compared to, say, the stalwart that was John Abbott and, um, you know, the, the, the kind of aimlessness of Alexander Mackenzie. And so he seemed to at least want and genuinely want certain changes. As we mentioned, he did have some accomplishments and did support things like women's rights and so on um and but you know it, from the conservative point of view it basically was the last great leader that they had for a while right and it kind of deflated the party after um with the next two uh, prime ministers that we're going to be talking about. oh yeah this whole thing is just the downfall of the conservative party yes like it was the last little gasp before everything collapsed again <laughs> Do you have anything that you wanted to add about Thompson before we move He's on? He's probably the best of the four. I don't know, actually. Him or Bowel. Yeah, I, I I have a bit of sympathy for Bowel. But I, yeah, he, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I like uh, uh, again. We can we have to be very careful with who we say is the best, just because they didn't do sure. much. But it sure it sure doesn't seem like it was Tupper <laughs> or Abbott. So we'll come back to them because obviously as listeners might know we rank our prime ministers after so at yeah, the end so of we the got, episode right now so we got mcdonald's still number one yeah mckenzie was second. a close two yeah 
And this is going to be three, four, five, and six. And we're going to have to figure yeah. out where they go. But Abbott's probably going to be like five, Tupper six, oh, and then we'll have to figure out Bowen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so Mackenzie Bowen. Um, let's, I, I want to actually start with these caricatures here because I think they give some idea of what we're in for in this case. Um, I just, is he like beating up Parliament or something in the first one? Kind of, right? Um, so this is a caricature that was actually made after uh, his prime ministership because he did stay in politics. Um, Bell was only prime minister from 94 to 96. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, this was a speech, uh, a reference to a speech he gave in 1905 that was berating his former cabinet for his treatment. Ah. Right. So uh, for people who might not have opened the link, which are obviously in the description, we see like Mackenzie Bowell on a cloud that's written Senate, just kind of shouting at a bunch of people who are being blown away. And in the, um, in the actual speech bubbles, you see repudiation, uh, condemnation, denunciation, rejection, right? Uh, and all kinds of other terms like this. I can't read what's on the actual paper that he, uh, so long as I have a voice, it's a bit, it's a bit fuzzy. It's, uh, yeah, he's basically berating everyone. <laughs> right. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, especially fuck you. You're cool. Exactly. Right. That's, that's kind of what we're pointing to, which again, kind of indicates what we're going for with Bowles from prime ministership in this case. I love it. And the second, the second caricature, do you want to Best describe prime what minister. He it's, is he walking a lonely road? He's on oh. ice. Oh, he's on in this okay. case. I, but I think so because they have skates on, so I assume they're they're on ice. Yeah. It's the Manitoba school question. Why the why the fuck did Manitoba school politics determine the thrust of Canada for like what twenty years? No, in this case, it was more like a, it was like a decade or something like that. Still, why was like can you? This is the most important question in Canadian politics at the time. Yeah, yes, the absolutely. turn of the century. We're about to head into the 20th century. America is grappling post-slavery world. Mm -hmm. Britain's going through the end of its imperialism almost, like the beginning of its downfall of imperialism. And in Canada, we go, what about those Manitoban schools? That's the thing. It's like, it's, it's such a microcosm of the debates that we see all the time in Canada, French and English, because Catholics yeah. were typically French and Protestants typically English. And like, it's okay. This is a very, very tenuous um, comparison, but you know, how you just mentioned slavery in the U S but you know how like part of the civil war was determining, okay, well, which state had what kind of rights as America was moving West. Right. Mm -hmm. It's you're seeing a similar thing here in so far as like as Canada is moving west, you have to come to terms with like, OK, well, we're a bilingual country. Uh, so what kind of rights do we give these new citizens? Is it a British type of place or is it a mix of both? Do we let the people decide as uh, based on what kind of immigrants there are? Pretty similar stuff to what you see still today in many ways. Uh, but this is this debate happening live. Mm -hmm. right so uh, yeah it is frustrating but yes and it seems almost tame in comparison but um yeah it's very much uh, at the forefront and so yeah bowels on skates in front of like cracking ice in the water there's manitoba school with a with a question mark and on one side of the water you have mm -hmm. non-interference and on the other side it's remedial legislation i think is what is said there so either he can actually legislate or just do like the previous two and just ignore it. <laughs> and in the background, making his first caricature appearance on the show is Sir Laurie. Bum, uh, bum, bum. Looking on, wondering if Bowel is going to just collapse through the ice. <laughs> it's like everybody knew this was the path. We yeah, there's a great... There's a great uh, device that George Bowering uses in his book that I use often for our prime minister episodes, Egotists and Autocrats, in which during this period, every time the conservatives blunder, he snap cuts to Laurier in the House of Commons, just sitting back and smiling to himself as he's watching this dumpster fire of a party self-immolate. 
<laughs> and it's great. I think it's a great device of just him saying, setting the seeds of like why the Liberal Party was able to um, mm -hmm. make such a meteoric rise in the aftermath or like in the next elections that were happening, you know, that were going to happen in 1896. Yeah. So um Mackenzie Bowell have you ever heard of him I feel like he's the lesser known of all of the ones that we're talking about today they're all lesser known what the fuck are you talking about they're all lesser known the most well-known would be John Abbott and even the then Tupper. debatable We've talked about Tupper before at least we talked about him in our yeah but I didn't remember episode. him until now <laughs> fair it's, enough like it's, they're all it's what is this episode? So it's, you're saying like, oh, Mackenzie Bell. Yeah, he's one of the lesser known of these four unknown. It's like saying that he's the, le he's the least popular bacteria among four fucking bacteria. Nobody knows who you're talking about anyway. Fine. Anyway. <laughs> um, so Bowel actually was an Orangeman which we've talked about many times on the show before. They're kind of like radical Protestants or they advocated for a Protestant ascendancy, right? Uh, both in Canada and in the United Kingdom. Um, and Bowell did help MacDonald throughout MacDonald's tenure as prime minister, especially as the person who could rally the more right-wing elements, right? Of, again, what was nominally a liberal conservative party, right? Um, so... Bowell's position as an Orangeman was um, was very much to be able to bring those people toward more towards McDonald's kind of uh, center right, right party. Right. Um, he would serve as the Minister of Customs, which would definitely have a major role in implementing McDonald's national policy, right, which we've talked extensively about. So, you know, Bowell is not unfamiliar with the ins and outs of politics no, he knows right. what he's exactly um and certainly he would have a, i think probably a better in or at least on the surface he seems like he has a better into politics than thompson would have right already he's protestant so it helps and he knows how to smooth people over a lot more easily than thompson did but obviously the people didn't like him. Yes, because but really the the, all the government would... wants is a figurehead like that the rest of parliament can control. That's all they really literally want. At, at, at this point. That's all they're looking for after a, such a strong figure like McDonald. Yeah, because no one was expect. They should have seen it coming because he was old as dirt, but like no one was expecting. Old as dirt. He dive. was drunk most of the time and he had illness after illness. Like Everyone should have, like, at least planned a replacement, but no one had somehow any foresight enough to do they that. They literally <laughs> thought he was just a legend in his time. God damn it's it. madness. So the madness of Canadian politics continues to astound and bore me in equal measure. <laughs> God damn it. So, oh, so America, what did you do for this recent decade? Oh, you know, we fought over the rights of people about slave rights and if they can be, if they should be changed. What did you do, Canada? Oh, we fought over schools in Manitoba. Plus, because Canada, Canada had stopped slavery before Confederation, so it was not a. Yeah. That's a anyway. different conversation, though. But anyway, that's a different conversation. That's a conversation um, to talk with our boy George, who came in for his yeah, long interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which you could definitely listen to. We've had some really good feedback from that one, by the way. Yeah. Yay! Um, so it is a bit of a mystery how. To, uh, how Bowell ended up PM after Thompson because again people thought that Tupper would after two attempts come back but God Thompson they built like, Tupper uh, up so much yeah but Tupper was like nah I'm still happy in London <laughs> Tupper was like I, I'm gonna head out and then just die damn it so so um the, the, the reason why Bowell ended up was, A, because Tupper didn't want to. He was still happy in London. But also, Bowell was the most senior member of the government and had also some experience as PM because when Thompson would make trips overseas, Thompson would act, uh, sorry, Bowell would act as prime minister in his absence in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, the governor general, Lord Aberdeen, chose him as the new as the head of the new government right okay. as the new head of government sorry it wasn't a new government but yeah um funny enough right despite and this is why i have some sympathy for bowel despite him being a 
an advocate of Protestant ascendancy, he would actually do more for the Manitoba schools question than the two, than the previous two, right. um, than the previous two uh, prime ministers. In right? Canadian politics, you um, die, you live or die in Canadian politics by your response to the Manitoba school question. Apparently, that should be a number one question still to this day, just before in debates. So, what are your thoughts on? Manitoba. Manitoba school if you question. were there at the time, what would you have done about the Manitoba schools? Please, Mr. Trudeau. I think I feel like Trudeau and Singh would be the only ones who know what the hell they were talking about. Yeah, literally, yeah. Um, so Mao would actually support uh, legislation that was drafted in 1895, so a year into his tenure, to restore uh, Roman Catholic schools in the province of Manitoba. And his reason for that was a need to adhere to the British North America, right? Which again was surprise, which did, uh, which did st- have him stick to his guns as a kind of Anglophile uh, or someone who, um, who saw the, uh, the federal government as like the utmost uh, power in this case. He favored federal power over uh, provincial power. Um, but also is surprising, as I was saying, uh, because you wouldn't have expected this from him. Um, but despite this, this legislation wasn't implemented because his own party would go against him on this. <laughs> of course they did. Um, and Bell would be hesitant in pushing through this policy. And so it wasn't, um, so it, it ultimately his own Tory cabinet just kind of slowly uh, disintegrated right over this, and some in the government argued that there should be a referendum about uh, about this whole question. And, and in the Bell back, there were whispers. There were whispers for the demand of the promised child, Charles Tupper, whose spot was unfairly and unjustly <laughs> stolen from him by this pretender named McKen. Exactly, and so ultimately, you know, Bowell would come in and spent most of his two years trying to heal divisions in his party, which had just exacerbated by this point, right? Um, And literally half of his ministers resigned in 1896, and he tried to have them replaced, but ultimately it just collapsed in on itself. And Bell would just bitterly resign um, in in that midst, right? Which explains his, uh, that first caricature that we were looking at Right, because ten years later he was still pissed. (laughs) (laughs) What a legend! Oh my god! So, yeah, and during this time, like, just to also kind of show you how much, um, how how much bitterness there was, Manitoba, uh, the Manitoba government called a snap election just to reinforce the Liberal government to specifically oppose. Bowles, um, Bowles' tenure in Ottawa and what he was trying to do My for Catholic rights. God, right? imagine so, like, being things are going that bad much of right. like a bunch of assholes. I know it's fascinating. And um, famously, um, Bowles would uh, call his caucus a nest of traitors when he resigned. There's no, if you're gonna call quote, something a nest, you gotta call it an animal. Come on, yeah, I know what a loser. Worst prime minister so, of the four. Zero out of ten, just for that. Zero so, out of ten. Bad metaphors. I want to turn to Bowering again, real quick, um, because he has, I think, an interesting. Who's Bowering quote again? Here, one of the sources that I use for oh, okay. uh, for for this. Um, Lay it on. Some say that Bowell's singular lack of success as prime minister was due to his stupidity. Others blame his tendency to blow his little top as evidenced by him holding uh, holding that grudge. Some point to a remarkable absence of humility. Still, there are those who would have us regard the bad luck of somehow attaining the first minister's chair just when the long-smoking Manitoba schools debate burst into hot flame. Right. And Okay, so his name is Bowles, right? Yeah. How B-O-W- many jokes yeah. how, how many jokes do you think they made? Why is there not a caricature of him shitting the bed and the bed being parliament or something like that should have been the very first caricature somebody made i'm sure 
I'm sure someone thought of it. I couldn't find one for the life. I'm sorry. Damn it. I Zero agree. out of 10 podcast. Worst podcast in the history of podcasts. But I agree. That would have been an bowels. absolutely. <laughs> the, do- the jokes write themselves, folks. God. But yeah, but I do think Where's that. our government so shit? Why are, well, I why agree are our that he... Why are our satirical cartoonists so crap at the job? But that's the thing. It's like none of them stayed long enough to warrant that good of a that good of a thing. So, and, and I feel like Bowering does have a good point in saying like, he was also just dealt a really crappy hand. And like, yes, he shit the bed, but he was just yeah. really dealt a poor hand to, to deal with. And I don't think whether it was Bow or any other prime minister, I think Bowering is right in pointing to the fact that like, this is when the school question just exploded, right? It just so happened that Bao was the one to actually try to push forward legislation and it blew up in his face. Right? <laughs> his bowels blew so, up in his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I am a, I do have the maturity of a high schooler. Thank you very much. That's fine. That's what the show is for. Just get it all out. Um, Anything else you want to say about this prime minister? I don't think there's much to say. Yeah, he's up. He got he's, betrayed. He's, he's up there with Thompson of being like the better of the four grumpy men, but uh-huh. sure, still not. I mean, Abbott has yeah. the excuse of he was literally didn't want to be there and he was just a placeholder until they found the act. Yeah. So like that's so, his excuse. Thompson, the, I want to make it clear. Wait, yeah. I don't think that the prime ministers themselves were bad or ineffectual or whatever. I just think that Every single time they came in, their party was bad. Yeah. And it was this very large question of what do we do in the face of a lack of men? That nobody had an answer. And these four guys, like they came to bat and they swung and they tried, but it just, their party worked too much. It, I, I would agree with that. Definitely. Like, I'm, I'm sure but if then, all these guys had gone a fair chance, they would have either been completely neutral or in the case of Bowell and Thompson, maybe even positive. I could see that happening. But we'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> now we're almost there. We're almost, remember folks, it's darkest before the dawn and the sunny ways are here to come. So we're, we're finally getting to the person who many claim should have been prime minister from the start, but who famously did not want to. I love, Charles Tupper. I love this caricature that you have. It's Sir Charles Tupper in the parliament. And it has him said like he is huge. He is larger than, like, I'm guessing he was a big guy. Yeah, he was not a tiny person. Yeah. But they also have him being, like, this larger-than-life presence, blah, 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 like, setting him up as this big, iconic figure. What was it, 10, 20? Yeah, t- uh, not, uh, yeah 10 weeks. 10 weeks in office. There we go. Boop. And so the, the literal translation, because this character is in French, the translation is, so as I was saying, Mac is, as Mac was saying, like, huge figure among many, many MP Sir Charles Tupper, Tupper in the Parliament. What liberals fear he is, what the conservatives wanted him to be, and what he thinks he. <laughs> so, just very funny. What a guy. Um, so Tupper um, was a uh, practice as a doctor in Amherst, right before mm-hmm. entering Nova Scotia politics as a conservative in the mid 1850s, and he immediately assumed a prominent role. And I feel like. It's really in this time that Tupper proved himself as a as a worthy politician, right? And why people really associate him uh, associate positively with him as a conservative um, is because he would very much bring the Nova Scotia conservatives who had held like office tenuously throughout the 1850s. He would really bring them to decisive victory in 1863 right right so he did manage to turn the party around and it's under his leadership that he implemented railroad and education policies advocated intercolonial union and he was the one who initiated the call for conference in charlottetown that eventually led to confederation right so he is like a major linchpin in what we know as canada today um he was one of the main authors, along with MacDonald, of the constitutional framework of the British North America Act. And he would serve as a regional counselor to MacDonald and held several key cabinet posts. Right. And actually, he would claim to have invented the national policy that MacDonald ran on right, as a campaign during his, um, during his return after the, after the Pacific scandal. Mm-hmm. It's a bit subject to debate, but he certainly had a hand in it. Um, 
and he would become um, he would become high commissioner to Britain right throughout much of the 1880s. And he was always advocating for Canada's interest, right? Protecting Canada's economy and especially the maritime fisheries from the United States, which we didn't talk a lot about in this episode, but as we saw under Thompson, right, was very much a concern for Canadians, right? Because we, we forget it's right around this time that America, for example, uh, took control of Alaska, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, needed to negotiate fishing rights off the coast of uh, the Maritimes. So there were some concerns there. Uh, and Thompson, as well as Tupper, outside of being prime minister, would definitely um, help negotiate these things. Um, and he would be an early advocate of a codependent empire, right? So arguing that Britain, yes, is the center, but that each of the uh, each of the elements of the British Empire should also have a higher say in what happens throughout the right. empire. Right. Um, so he would come into uh, he would come into the prime ministership after Bowell left, right? And literally, there was no one else. Like we've, we've there, we eat, Tupper has to come in, right? And <laughs> we've run out of things to do. Let's bring in Please. the topper. Like he was considered a war horse uh, uh, really at the time. And there's a, a book that we were sent actually by a listener um, that she wrote that actually names, Tup- uh, it's named Charles Tupper War Horse. And I do think it is kind of interesting to, to think of him that way of like always wanting and always advocating for more uh, despite him coming on in age. Right? Uh, and he would basically be brought in to lead the party into an election, right? Because by the time that he arrives, it's election time. Um, the conservatives barely managed to crawl to the finish line of their mandate. And uh, Tupper, um, Tupper was bringing them into an election against, as you we were saying, a young upstart named Wilfred Laurier. Um, <laughs> they saw Wilfred and they're like, God damn it, we got to bring Tupper in now. Before it's too late. We see this young guy. We got to bring in this old, humbled man who didn't want to be prime minister into the <laughs> into the race. But I think they were planning on exactly that. Like people knew who Tupper was. I think they were planning on the name recognition of yeah, it. Yeah, they were hoping for uh, that. Yeah, exactly. And say like, look, now that we have Tupper as the head of the party, we'll be able to like bring the stability that we need. Um, and then this French motherfucker stepped up and said, I don't think so. No, 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 no. And part of, yeah, that's exactly that. Because Laurier would be able to 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 bring in Quebec to his side much more easily than the Conservatives could. Bonjour, hello, je parle de franglais. The, you laugh, but that's literally it. Oh, I know. That's why I laugh because I know that's what happened. I know that history is history is funnier than anything I could come up with. <laughs> so, um, Tupper would be defeated in 1896, as you're saying weeks into his um into his prime ministership uh, but he would continue to lead the party in opposition until 1900 yeah. um he goes down in history still to this day as the shortest reigning prime minister in canada's history wow not even and Kim Campbell beat. no exactly she stayed for a few months uh yeah. he did not <laughs> but he did he stayed for two less months um and he's remembered, I think, to this day, more for being behind the scenes in the early days of Confederation, right? And advocating more of uh, more of that. Uh, and I think that that's a large part of the problem is that whoever they were trying to pick, everybody they were trying mm. to pick was still somebody that was talking about Confederate yeah. Tupper, Bowell, Johnson, or Thompson, sorry. They were all guys who were major parts of Confederation, but Confederation happened almost 30 years ago. Yeah. The nation yeah, exactly. was ready to move on to talk about something else. Okay. So, so this all sets the stage. How do we how do we rank it? How do we rank it? Okay, so McDonald's still one, Mackenzie still two. And then oh, I don't know, Thompson or Bowell would go three and four. You can put those two either way, really. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. I think. I think I would put Bowell at three just because he actually took a swing, even if it right. missed, but he actually took a swing that Thompson didn't. 
Yeah. Honestly, uh, yeah, I would, I would put, put I'd put Abbott five, Tupper six. Not just for the time thing, but okay. just for Abbott's willingness to be the guy that like be the placeholder. Despite you know? his like yeah. you had he had to know he was not gonna be there for a while or do anything, but he was still like, okay, I'll take the heat, I'll take the shit. Like I'll be the placeholder until we get the guy. Whereas Tupper did just had no, no. <laughs> fucks left to give. Yeah. So I'm gonna say now this next this next prime minister, I think he's gonna be our our next two parter of a prime minister since McDonald. Probably. Oh yeah. We're Probably. we're gonna need two episodes to talk about Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Didn't stay as long as McDonald, but his impact is big enough that i think you're right we'll need two episodes on it well he also has the longest unbroken term that's true that's true absolutely and he's also it's just he's just important for being like the first non-conservative right or no mcdonald was a liberal he is the first liberal yeah so mcdonald was like the it was still the tory party but it was like he was trying to bring liberal elements into it like a progressive Uh, yeah and i don't know it's we're gonna see and, and i think again Lori brought in that idea of moving beyond confederation mm, we need to bring yeah. the country into the 20th century and didn't he famously say that the 20 the 20th century would be the century of canada or something he absolutely did and that was a lie but i mean we could debate it i guess yeah it, it wasn't necessarily it was a good century for canada yes but it was not in some canada regards century. it was no exactly yeah you're right Anything else you want to add to any of these grumpy um, old men railing against Manitoba? It's like, if people say Canadian history is boring, you got to point to this. This little set of goddamn Russian nesting dolls of prime ministers. Like, you start with Abbott at the top. He's the first layer. It's like, okay, he's just a placeholder. We're going to go one layer in. Okay, we got Thompson. He was the guy that McDonald wanted. But he, like, he only stayed for a little bit. We're going to go another layer in. Okay, there's Bowell. He was like not, and he was there. He was behind it all. And then you take it a little bit further in, and then there's Tupper, little Tupper sitting there at the bottom. Was there? It's, it's oh, damn! It's, it's so funny. Anyway, thank you for everyone for listening. Remember, folks, it's darkest before the dawn, but the sunny ways are coming for some people. God, so, yeah. no, this is going to be the first honest challenge to McDonald's placement as the top prime minister. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I, Lori, I the, so. the real question isn't if Laurier is. McDonald's Mackenzie's going down to third. Oh, yeah, easily. So, actually, I'm curious like, what other prime ministers do you think could upset the order in a big way? Oh, like, what are some of the other? Yeah, that was the other one I was thinking. Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King. Um, The original Trudeau. I think, I think, yeah. The original Trudeau. The original Trudeau. Pearson. Um, Yeah, let's be Pearson. I think Diefenbaker is sim- is in a similar is in a similar position as Bowell in which he tried. He really I think he Who's genuinely he was in the fifties, late fifties. Um, oh. I think he genuinely did try uh, something. Well, there's yeah. Louis Same Saint. For Joe oh, okay, John Diefenbaker. Yeah. Mm. Well, there's a lot of them. Like this is great for a lot because you don't learn about all these different guys that much in Canadian history. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because a lot of the time, I think, again, they're in a similar position as Bowell where they try something and then there's either their their cabinet goes against them or like other um, other situations just make it so they can't do as much as they yeah. wanted to. But yeah, so calling it now the big disruptors, William Lyon, Mackenzie King, our, guy, our boy, uh, Lester V. Pearson, mm-hmm. and then the, the mad gangster himself here, Trudeau. Yeah, I'm calling it now. There is but We've got no our top five about this. here. And now we just have to the decide bottom the one order. Is, the, the bottom one is going to be Mulroney. Or Harper. Oh, Harper's at the bottom. I think <laughs> the, the wild card of the bunch that we're going to see is Jean Chrétien. Ooh, okay. Okay. He's going to be our wild card. We're, we'll keep that in mind. Okay. Yeah, so, I don't know. People who are listening all the way to this part here of us just rambling at this point, let us know who, like, what your order is. At this point, yeah. we have, like, six PMs. Yeah, let us know what... Uh, yeah. Oh, you would we, yeah, we've already, yeah, so we've already set up the top five as, like, the aggregate ranking from McLean's and stuff. Yeah. It's Mackenzie King, Laurie, McDonald, Trudeau, Pearson, and then six is Louis St. Laurent. And oh, I, I don't agree it. with that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then our, our good man, Jean Chrétien, Robert Bourdain, Mulroney, ninth. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> This is going to be fun. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about I'm that. I'm excited. As we're being... 
Where okay, where do they put uh, where do they put Bowel, for example? Bowel is second to last. Ooh, ouch. Okay. And then Kim Campbell is actually no. Okay. Poor yeah, Campbell. Clark. They got an 18. Okay. I can tied with Tucker. Okay. So Joseph Clark and Tupper are both tied at 18. Tupper, there's no way that Tupper makes more sense than to put him above Bowel. I'm yeah. sorry, that makes no sense. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't even. Honestly, a lot of these, like, if they did a survey or anything to rank these people, like, mm -hmm. it's kind of useless because most Canadians don't have a history of their prime ministers. Yeah. It's not yeah. what we. Yeah. And to be fair, if we were looking at them from a wider perspective, I could see why Tupper would be higher on the list. Right, but purely from a prime minister standpoint, it makes no sense that Tupper would be anywhere near the top. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I think we'll leave it at that for yeah, for for today. For now, so Mackenzie, where can people support? Us? Well, you're here on Spotify, and that's obviously the number one way to support and listen to us. We also have our Patreon account with special episodes and a special series I like to call Pop Canada, where we talk about the pop cultural landscape of Canada and how it tries to remain relevant. Our latest episode mm -hmm. is on James Cameron who is Canadian, yeah. apparently. We also did an episode talking about Canada's politics and the view of Canada as one of the world's stable countries, yep. which is kind of like interesting to think about, in my opinion, that we're this Canada is sort of like this foundational country of stability that people look at and look to, you know? Hell yeah. We're just a rock. And, uh, and we'll probably have like, a new episode out soon. Yeah. If you... Other ways to support, obviously, through the affiliate links through word of mouth let us let your friends know let your fellow history professors know if you hate us tell people why tell us why you hate us we love receiving email oh, yeah. it brightens up our day even if they're death threats um, especially if they're death threats yeah i think that's about it all right well thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you on next time either on pop canada or on historia canadiana thanks everyone for listening bye bye <laughs>